Welcome to My Fair Katie, a film review podcast. I, Katie Schimmick, watch movies with my dad. That'd be me, Scott Schimmick. Together we will dive into sometimes deep but hopefully always fun discussion of classic films. Today's movie is Eight Men Out. 1919, the year America saw Major League Baseball played a whole new way. Underhanded. Makes it sound like they're playing softball. (laughs) All right. The inside story of how the national pastime became a national scandal. Makes it sound like water, Kate. When the cheering stopped, there were eight men out. Sounds okay. Yeah. At least it's got the... Yeah, at least it sounds like it's related to the movie. Yeah. Made in 1988, Eight Men Out was also directed by John Sales, who also plays sports writer Ring Lardner. Author Studs Turkel plays the other sports writer, figuring out the fix, Hugh Fullerton. Michael Lardner plays infamous gangster Arnold Rothstein. Michael Mantell plays the former lightweight champion, A. Battelle. Christopher Lloyd plays small-time hustler Bill Burns. And now, your 1919 Chicago White Sox. Bill Irwin plays Hall of Famer Eddie Collins, second base and batting second. John Cusack plays Buck Weaver, batting third and playing the hot corner. D.B. Sweeney plays Shoeless Joe Jackson, left field batting cleanup. Protecting Jackson in the order is Charlie Sheen, playing Happy Felsch in center. Michael Rooker plays Chick Gandel, the man with hands of iron, playing first base and batting sixth. Don Harvey plays Swede Risberg, shortstop, batting seventh. Gordon Klopp plays Ray Schalk, catching batting eighth. David Strathern takes the ball first in the series as Eddie Seacott. Your day two starter is Lefty James Reed playing Lefty Williams and rounding out the rotation is Jace Alexander playing Dickie Kerr. The club is managed by John Mahoney playing Kid Gleason. It's September 1919. The Chicago's White Sox just clinched the American League pennant. Their bonus for a great season? A few bottles of flat champagne. Gamblers Sleepy Bill Burns and Billy Marg can see the players' discontent. They talk to Chick Gandel, convincing him to select a group of players to throw the World Series. They can earn much more money by playing cricket than by winning. A group of players, including Chick, Swede, Lefty, go along with the scheme as long as Eddie's in it. Shoeless Joe Jackson, an illiterate and the team star, is pressuring him to join. Buck hears the plan, but he wants nothing to do with the fix. When the Best of Nine series begins, Eddie hits the first batter, signaling to gangster Arnold Rothstein that the fix is on. He then pitches poorly and gives up five runs in four innings, highlighted by a triple from the Reds pitcher. Lefty throws game two, while Gandel, Risberg, and Happy make glaring mistakes on the field. The players become upset, however, when the various gamblers involved fail to pay their promised money up front. Chicago sports writers Ring Lardner and Hugh Fullerton grow increasingly suspicious. Meanwhile, Gleason continues to hear rumors of a fix, but he remains confident that his boys will come through in the end. Dickey isn't in on the fix, and he wins game three for the Sox, making both gamblers and his crooked teammates nervous. Eddie loses again in Game 4, and Lefty loses again in Game 5. Facing elimination, the Sox win Game 6 in extra innings. The manager intends to bench Eddie for his next start, but feeling guilty over tanking his previous games, Eddie begs for another chance. Kid reluctantly agrees and is given an easy Game 7 win. Unpaid by the gamblers, Lefty also turns straight, but a gangster threatens to murder his wife. He purposely pitches so poorly that the Sox find themselves in a deep hole, and they lose the series. Fullerton writes an article condemning the White Sox. A criminal investigation begins into the fixing of the series. Eddie and Joe admitted to prosecutors that a fix was in. As a result of the news, the eight men are tried but acquitted thanks to the crooked jury. However, newly appointed commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis bans the eight men for life because they either intentionally lost the games or as Buck did knew about the fix and didn't report it to team officials. Six years later, Buck watches Shoeless Joe play a semi-pro game in New Jersey under the assumed name Brown. Hearing other fans respect his true identity, Weaver tells him that Jackson was the best player he ever saw. When asked point blank if the player is indeed Shoeless Joe, Buck denies it, protecting his former teammate. All right, reviews. AFI Top 100, this doesn't fall in any lists. Oh, that doesn't really surprise me. (laughs) Rotten Tomatoes gives it an 86. That seems kind of high. That does seem pretty high. Popcorn rating of 80. That seems a little high, too. A Metacritic of 71. That's oh. high, too. <laughs> and an IMDb of 7.2. That's also high, because isn't, like, Rocky 7 point something? Yeah, I think it's a 7.7. 7. Yeah. 
This won the Oscar for nothing. This was nominated for zero Oscars. Again, not very surprising. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Probably the worst movie we're going to watch this season from a critical standpoint. Earmuffs. There's uh, some salty language in this. There's one F, so it keeps its PG-13 rating. And there's lots more minor swearing. I didn't count up all the uh, the other ones. Uh, there's a lot of smoking. Smoking indoors and some huge wads of tobacco shoved into people's cheeks. A lot of spitting. A lot of drinking. And a fair amount of gambling. Maybe you shouldn't have let me watch this. <laughs> You're just saying that because you didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. A historical background. Back in 1919, you know what the biggest three sports were? Baseball, boxing, and horse racing. Football was just a crazy game that some college kids played to prove they were tough. Basketball wasn't much of a thing yet either. It was horse racing, boxing, and baseball. Baseball was huge. So when this happened, baseball was like the biggest thing in America. And this rocked the baseball world. And this was the end of what's called the dead ball era. The next year started the live ball era. And you may remember in the movie... Um, they talk about the new baseball for next year. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. that new baseball was, they mentioned it, tighter wound. I don't know why a sports writer is showing next year's new baseball. Maybe that, mm-hmm. that should go in the nitpicks to one of the pitchers. Like, how is he going to know? But if you look at the stats for 1919, Babe Ruth, who was a pitcher for the Red Sox, he had 29 home runs. Number two in baseball had 10. And that was a lot. <laughs> And his name was Home Run Baker. That's how many home runs he hit with 10. He was such a big home run hitter, they called him Home Run Baker. And he had 10 home runs. The next year, Babe Ruth hit 54 with the new ball. So, yeah, it changed a lot, the new ball. Or maybe Babe Ruth just got better. (laughs) (laughs) I think almost doubling his score, he got better. Well, he doubled his waistline over the two years old as hot dogs. He was a big, chunky guy. You don't know that Babe Ruth is like a portly fellow. No. Okay, our next movie is Pride of the Yankees. <laughs> You're going to see Babe Ruth and then you'll understand. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about our hero. Who's the hero of the movie? Um, I don't think that there is a hero. No. Who did the movie try to portray? Oh, no, Kid. I'm going to say Kid. Kid? No, oh, yeah. no. Because he, he didn't do anything even though he knew that there is. The fix going on. Who did the movie try to portray outside of the facts of history? Shoeless Joe or Buck. Yeah, probably Shoeless Joe and Buck, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to the rest of them. I think Buck because they showed him with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah, they were really trying to show the story from Buck's perspective. Mm -hmm. So was he a good guy? Yeah. Was he? Yeah, but he made a mistake. He should have told. He definitely should have told. That's why he didn't get to play baseball ever again. Would you have told? I don't know. Because then everybody else would like not like you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's kind of the why he didn't. I know it sounds stupid, and it is. He gave up his entire career. What about Shoeless Joe? Let's go with the facts as presented in the movie. Do you think he he was a good guy? Didn't he, like, agree to it, but he just, like, didn't do it? Because he was pressured into it, but then he decided not to when they were playing. Yeah, the way they portray in the movie is he he took the money, but he didn't didn't drop anything, didn't try, didn't, didn't not try to do his best. Yeah. Even though I used a double negative there. Mm-hmm. So I think Buck was a better hero. Yeah. Because he shouldn't have taken the money. Should have been Mr. Noodle. Who's Mr. Noodle? Mr. Noodle from Elmo. He was the college guy who didn't take part in the conversations, was maybe suspicious, but didn't know anything about it. Dickie, too, because... Dickie, Dickie definitely. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't even suspicious. He was just a goofball. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say... He played, too. He played well, and he played harder. He did. He won... He won a game for them. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. Dickie. Dickie. My Fair Kitty is brought to you this week by Schultz's Vichy Water. Feeling fatigued? Have you got sour belly? Muscle cramps got you down? 
Try Salcha's Vichy Water. It helps with digestion and relieves your overly acidic diet. For generations, the Salchas have been bottling Vichy Water at their natural springs in southern France. You've seen their ads at Comiskey Field? Get yours now while supplies last. It's the favorite drink of Lieutenant Renault. Salchas Vichy Water. That's Salchas Vichy Water. All right, Katie, what time is it? It's time for Daddy Don't Know. What don't Daddy know this week? This week was kind of hard because when I would Google, like, facts about 8 Men Out or 8 Men Out cast or something, whatever, it would always come up with people's, like, opinions on the movie. Like, is 8 Men Out real? Like, what actually happened? And Director John Sayles was um, obligated to running a t- movie under two hours, so to inspire the cast to talk fast, he showed them the film City for Conquest. The total runtime was an hour, 59 minutes, and 48 seconds. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So is that part of the problem of the movie, though? It was too long. Well, it was too fast. Like, they talk so fast, sometimes it's hard to understand them. It was also too long. <laughs> It's too boring is what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't mean it's too long. It just means it's too boring. (laughs) Okay, what else you got? I would have really liked it if it was shorter, though. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. John Sayles envisioned himself as a minor role, so after working on a decade to get the ship turned into a movie, he was too old to portray a baseball player, so instead he cast himself as Ring, a sports writer, Ring Lardner, (laughs) because he was too old. After all of it. John Sales also used a cardboard cutout to fill the stadiums. And because they. Really? Yeah, they needed a thousand extras to film close up and panning shots of live fans. So to lure the extras, Charlie Sheen's volunteered to take part in a contest for one extra lunch to have with him. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Lefty Williams, one of the eight men out, missed most of the 1918 season serving in the military. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's pretty scary. Mm-hmm. On the stand, White Sox manager Kid Gleason tells the lawyer that he was a pitcher during his playing games. He pitched about 400 games and played the second base in almost 1,600 games. Really? Yeah. Did he have a winning record? I don't know. Oh. You got any more? No, that's it. Oh, those were good, though. I like that. Where'd they film it? Indianapolis. Well, there you go. You got another one. <laughs> <laughs> At the AAA ballpark in Indianapolis? Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. I like the uh, billboards they put up. It made it look really like an old-time field. Mm-hmm. But just because you're a bad guy doesn't mean you have to be a bad guy. So who's the bad guy in the movie? Basically the totally everybody in the movie. <laughs> uh, I don't mean boring bad. I mean evil bad. Who's the worst one? Let's say that. Who's the worst one in the movie? Um, Risberg and Chick. Yeah, they're pretty bad. What about what about uh, what about the gamblers? They were just trying to make money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess that's just the way it was back then, huh? What about what about Charlie Kaminsky? He was a piece of work, wasn't he? Yeah, I don't know what that means. You don't know what piece of work means? No. Then why'd you say yeah? <laughs> um, he was a real. S- Trying to say it without using bad words. So why don't you just explain to me what that means? Yeah, I would explain with bad words, though. <laughs> he was a real jerk. Oh, yeah, because he wouldn't give them a raise. Wouldn't give them a raise. And Eddie, he... He promised them a bonus, and he gave them flat champagne. Yeah, and Eddie, he won 29 games, and he got benched for two weeks. So he didn't get his bonus for winning 30. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real underhanded move. So the setting, where is it set? Chicago, 1919. Could it have been set anywhere else? No. No, because nobody else cheated and it's a true story. Okay, fair enough. So I guess the setting was important to the story, huh? Yeah. So what did you think about the uh, filming and cinematography of the movie? I thought it was pretty boring. What would you think about the baseball scenes, for example, since we're doing sports movies this year? Like the filming of the baseball itself. I think that they were trying to hide that the actors were good baseball players. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Did you notice that the pitches, they, they look like softball? Like, not women's college softball. Like, you know, 
chubby 30 something year old man drinking beer softball <laughs> <laughs> how they would go loop right in yeah. <laughs> whenever they showed somebody actually hitting the ball <laughs> it was because the the balls were like slow they like going in yeah it wasn't it wasn't the best baseball playing i've seen it wasn't the most athletic crew of guys yeah that's a very good point how about the music i thought it was pretty straightforward too yeah, it was pretty uh, it was kind of period. It wasn't out of place like sometimes we see, but it wasn't memorable. Mm-hmm. Special effects? There weren't any, right? Not really. I mean, not even like good makeup stuff. How about costumes? The costumes were spot on. Were they spot on? Yeah, because I was around in 1919. <laughs> so that would have been over 100 years ago. Mm-hmm. At least I feel like they were pretty accurate. They sold me on it being accurate. Yeah. I can agree, too, because I was there. <laughs> you were there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. A lot of people tell me I look young for my age, so... Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so, do you have any nitpicks? Oh, boy, do I have nitpicks. <laughs> <laughs> well, just give me give me the, the highlights, the players' forefingers stick out of their gloves, and that practice started in 1950. Really? Yeah. I love doing that. I've always done that. In the room where the live coverage of the game one was being announced, all the men leave. The announcer states that the final score calling Cincinnati's team the Redlegs, they weren't called the Redlegs until 1944. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. That should have been a daddy don't know. Shoeless Joe Jackson and the hats fall off when he runs and hits a triple, but after he makes it to third and stands back up, his hat is on. And then Ring Lardner ties, unties his bow tie on the train, and then moments later, it's tied again. Did you like his song, by the way? Do you remember when he was singing, I'm forever blowing ball games? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think he wrote the movie just so that he could sing? No, because he's going to play one of the players, remember? Oh, yeah, right. In the film, and this one's like a small one, but in the film, Reisberg makes an error as a shortstop in the first game, but in real life, Chick Gandel makes the error, the only error. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. That's it. <laughs> Even though there was like so many, like all the websites that I went on to try to find facts, they were all nitpicks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about unanswered questions? I've got one. One that really bothers me is, who's hitting leadoff? They have eight men out. I know they play eight men out. There's more than eight players in the movie. Because you got Eddie Collins over at second base, and they they show him. He's not one of the eight men out. And then there's college guy. And then there's... uh, Dickie. Dickie. And lefty. I mean, he's not one of the original like lineup eight because they're pitchers. But the the leadoff batter Leopold, he's not in the movie at all. They don't even like mention him. So I wonder what happened to him. You know, they all got to play again in 1920 because the the trial and everything wasn't until after the 20 season. Really? Yeah. So do you have any more unanswered questions? No, I don't even want to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they want to go there. No. The big picture. So what's the message of the movie? Don't bet on baseball. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. What year did this come out? It's on the thing. 1988. 1988. 1988. It's a shame to think I'm out a couple years beforehand because Pete Rose bet on baseball in 1987. And now he's banned from baseball too. Pete Rose is kind of sad. Why? Because he was... Like one of the all-time great baseball players, and everything is tarnished not from playing baseball, but from when he was a manager. I guess he was still technically a player too, but he tarnished his entire reputation. Now he just sits in the sad mall in Las Vegas and signs autographs for people as they walk by and take their picture with him. Tours from Cincinnati. That does seem sad. It does seem sad. All right, overall in cinema history, where do you place this one? Well, maybe a couple of movies about tentacles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you don't watch a lot of bad movies. 
No. So you don't know that this isn't actually bad. It's just not particularly good. Yeah. But tentacles was bad. Yeah, but that was bad in a good way. <laughs> the Katie goes to the Odessa Steps Award for the best scene. I got a few nominees here. I got Buck playing baseball with the boys. But I mean, you know, like the neighborhood boys, not... Mm. The scene in the bar when the fix goes down and they keep cutting between the three different groups of people that are talking about the same thing in different ways. You know, Comiskey talking about how his players are going to win and can't lose. And the gamblers talking about how they can't lose if they get it fixed. And then the players talking. Mm -hmm. Um, The credit scene at the end when they're all uh, practicing baseball before you know it's like a it's like before everything went down and they're just having fun yeah. and you see everything they gave away and then i've got uh joe playing baseball in new jersey there at the end of that black and white scene yeah i like that one too the kitty goes to buck playing with the kids that's good because that... it shows you that he's a good character yeah that's what they really do to manipulate you to make you think buck's actually a good guy i got no opinion about it This goes to 11, the award for the most over-the-top moment. I've got a few here. I've got Ring singing about throwing baseball games. I've got Abe telling Bill that the players are already in, so forget about them. And he throws them like a thousand. Like, here's a thousand bucks. Just go. And she'd throw a thousand bucks at me. 1919 was actually a lot of money. Uh, and then I got Buck protesting in court, standing up, complaining about how he didn't get a chance to talk. You got any other nominees? No. Buck protesting in court. Okay. Thomas Mitchell Award. I don't even want you to say your nominees because I already know who it's going to be. <laughs> okay. Can I... The sports writers. Of okay. course. They're my favorite. Second. The Katie goes to the sports writers. Okay. Because they're the best in the movie. They're my favorite people. In you don't like Charlie Kaminsky? No. No? No. Okay, fine. I won't even tell you my other nominees. It's the pictures that got small. I have one nominee. I have only one nominee because this whole movie is based on one quote. This whole story is remembered. Oh, I know what it is. One quote. Sorry. And it's, say it ain't so, Joe. Say it ain't so. You have any other nominees? No. All right, then. The kitty goes to say it ain't so, Joe. <laughs> okay. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Who's the winner of this movie? Nobody. No, Cincinnati. Because they won. <laughs> Do you think they take pride in hanging up that 1919 World Series banner? No. No. All right, half a dozen eggs. Zero to 12. Rate the montage. Zero. Zero? No, I'm going to give it a four. Okay. Because I like the sports trainers. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about the montage. It's just like a learning montage. It's a sports movie, and it's not... There's no training. There's no, like, getting better in the montage. It's well, the sports writers are getting better. Their story's getting better oh, as they figure yeah. out what's going down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little disappointing for a sports movie. Mm-hmm. All right. Want to have a catch? Cryability? Zero to ten. Like a four. A four? That high? No. No, like a two because it's sad to see, like... Yeah, it's sad to see the kids. Yeah, they're heartbroken. Mm-hmm. All right. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Should this movie be remade? No. Do you think they could make it better if they redid it? Maybe. I mean, you didn't like it very much. You yeah, need to but more baseball. movies seem, these days seem to be getting longer and longer. And a baseball movie doesn't need to be two hours long. Okay. Besides Fear the Dreams, that movie can be two hours long. Well, you haven't seen The Natural yet. So if you were to, I mean, obviously you can't make changes to the story, right? Mm. I mean, I guess, would you portray the characters any differently? I mean, you read some of what actually happened as opposed to what's portrayed in the movie. Would you make Joe look like a villain? No. Because I don't think that Joe did anything wrong. Besides take the money. That's a big thing. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, it made Joe seem more like a villain. He shouldn't have taken the money. 
he shouldn't have taken the money. We should have put that in the over the top moments. I mean, they made him look really, really dumb, like beyond yeah. reasonable. Yeah, he could actually sign like because of a pattern that he had. He didn't write X's when he was signing. How do you know? Because that was one of my facts. Oh. <laughs> but I just forgot to say it. <laughs> okay. And I have a Shoeless Joe Jackson baseball card. Really? Yeah. It's about signed by Shoeless Joe? Yeah. No. I didn't know that. <laughs> I think we just paid for college. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who would Chris Pratt play in the remake if you were to do one? Nobody, because I don't want him being involved in this. Oh, but we're going to make him do a good one. Oh, okay. Then, um, Dickie. Really? Yeah. Not Buck? Yeah, but Buck, he was still kicked out. And Buck was semi-bad. Okay. Chris Pratt has no bad inside of him. <sighs> All right. That's a wrap. Brief takeaways from the movie. Uh, as always, I go first. I'll say that um, I think it, I always liked it, but it's not a particularly good movie. But it did teach me a lot about the 1919 White Sox. That's where I learned most of what I know about it was from this movie. So I give it kudos for that. But I can see why you don't like it. And the reason why we watched it isn't because when I curated the best sports films of all time, I thought this should be a movie you need to watch. I did it so that you would learn about the Black Sox scandal. So that when we watch Field of Dreams, you'll have a better understanding of what's going on in that. It wasn't a good movie but it wasn't <laughs> I feel like it was too long and it was hard to keep up with the pace of it because like I didn't know any of the characters names like <laughs> by the end of it and I thought that it just wasn't very good that's fair enough but I'm glad that we watched it so now we know more about the White Sox scandal so do you recommend this movie mm you want to watch Field of Dreams, yeah. <laughs> if you don't already know about it, then it's it's a better way than reading a textbook. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I failed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I hope your English teacher never listens to this. <sighs> Say that's a wrap, Katie. That's okay. <laughs> This episode of My Fair Katie was written and produced by Scott and Katie Schimmick. A special thanks for our music to Marty Chardy Esquire, the best IP lawyer on this side of the Hudson. <laughs>